Hey friends, welcome back to the homestead. Today I am gonna be answering some questions. You guys left a ton of really good questions on that what inspired me to homestead video. And so today I am gonna sit down and I'm gonna answer some of them. If I don't answer your question in this Q&A video, I will go back and reply to all the comments over there. I do try to reply to every comment. I really appreciate the fact that you would take your time out to comment, and so I wanna make sure that I reply to everybody. It's been super fun getting to know you guys down in the comments. I definitely, there's friendly faces that I recognize down there. I've been really enjoying getting to know you guys, so it's been super fun. So let's go ahead and get into it. So there were a few like, kind of common theme questions. So I did lump some of them together because they would be repetitive if I went through and kind of answered each one. Heather asks, what is our average rainfall for the area and what is our high and low? So where I live, I looked it up, our average rainfall is 42 inches a year. Um, this was kind of interesting, I didn't know this. Um, our average sunny days is 142 and the national average is actually 205. So where I live uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we definitely do have a lot of overcast days. So our growing zone, a bunch of you guys asked that. I, I live in zone 8B. So our average high of the year is 79 degrees. The US average is 85. And then our average low is 32 degrees and the US average is 21 degrees. We're a pretty temperate climate here. We don't get really hot and we don't get really cold but we do have a lot of overcast. So that does kind of hinder my gardening ability because plants love sun and I do struggle with that. Not only do I struggle with it, the amount of overcast days, but I've got some big trees on this property that I, I have to work around as well. So that's just one thing about living in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I was able to grow a lot of tomatoes last year. I was concerned about that, but my peppers didn't do super well last year. So I'm hoping that this year um, my peppers do better. This leads into the next question. Kayla asks, are there pest issues that we deal with? Absolutely, there are pest issues that we deal with. The number one issue that I deal with is slugs because we are a more moist climate. Slugs thrive here. I don't have to deal with um, vine borers or Japanese beetles. I follow a lot of people that have those issues. I don't have those issues here in the Pacific Northwest, but slugs are my nemesis. Last year, I planted out 20 basil plants and they were plants that I started from seed and I babied these little seedlings. And I put them out and they were probably too small and I did have my bed mulched at that point because everywhere says mulch, mulch, mulch. And the next day, all but two of those basil plants were eaten because slugs thrive and live in mulch. And so my raised beds, you'll notice, I do not mulch them. Um, I can't in this climate because there's too many slugs and there's just too many slugs. So I just will water my beds and know that they have to be watered more because the top layer of soil is going to dry out. I did mulch them over the winter. So all my beds had a huge layer of leaves over the winter to keep that soil protected over the winter. But as soon as a plant goes into that bed, all the mulch gets taken off because slugs are my enemies. I've been researching how to deal with them and I have a couple things up my sleeve that I'm gonna try this year. The number one thing that I did last year, or I didn't do, my husband did, is he came out here, he would come out here in the evenings, that's when they come out when it gets dark and the weather cools down, and he was shooting them with uh, his airsoft gun. I know it's probably not the most humane thing, but when you've spent so much time babying these darts and slugs eat them, um, you, I have a hard time being super compassionate about them. It was really funny, when I was planting in these beds, I couldn't figure out what all these little green things were, and then I realized they're my husband's airsoft pellets. Probably not the most organic thing to have in the garden, but um, if he's willing to help me slay slugs, then I'm all for it. Life with Amanda asks, what's the hardest part about homesteading? There's a couple things that I would say are the hardest part for me at least, one is the learning curve. There's a huge learning curve when it comes to homesteading. So what I'm working on learning this year is gardening. And what I've been struggling with is gardening doubt or a doubting my abilities because I am so new to this. And I've actually already killed quite a few things this year. Um, I'll be sharing that more in the upcoming videos. But over this last week, I had a pretty big failure and I was pretty discouraged. I couldn't even come out and film it for a while or take a picture because it was pretty devastating. And um, there's been a couple things that have happened, you know, but they're normal. I mean, it's what's gonna happen if you're learning a new skill um, and you're working with life and um, things that are out of your control, like weather. And so um, it's just learning to navigate those emotions, I guess, and 
realizing that it is a learning curve and that's part of the journey. So I had a moment and then I went ahead and I just planted some more seed and we'll just move forward. Laura Pope asked if my husband helped me build my raised beds and also am I gonna be doing any in-ground gardening as well? And yes, my husband did help me build these beds. We built 16, that was another question, how many beds did we build? We have 16 raised beds, they're 16 by four feet. My husband built them for me in January of 2019 and we built them out of red cedar so they should last for a good long time. I'm really grateful we built them when we did because we probably wouldn't be able to afford to build these raised beds if we had to build them this year because the cost of lumber has gone up so much. Another question was asked, are we gonna be building any more raised beds? And the answer is no, not right now. We have all the raised beds in that we want in. But along with Laura's question, I am trying to expand um, into some in-ground gardens as well. On this side of me, along all the raised beds, there are two Ruth Stout style beds that I'm working on slash lasagna gardening. Um, it's kind of a combination of the two Ruth Stout lasagna gardening and no-till actually. Um, it's just kind of Becky's method, I guess. And right now I currently have potatoes in there. And then on the other side of the garden over here, there is a pretty good size back to Eden style gardening that I'm working on with wood chips. That is going to be my winter squash and my corn. And then right behind me, I have some cattle panels and I am gonna be growing some tomatoes in um, another area that I'm doing back to Eden style gardening, which is just layering wood chips on wood chips on wood chips on wood chips. And it allows the soil to hold moisture and it breaks down, it's supposed to break down into really beautiful soil. I'm also gonna be experimenting with some straw bale gardening this year. These two straw bales, I am gonna plant some sweet potato slips in there. And so that's gonna be a fun experiment. Angela asked if I have a compost bin and do I have an unlimited access to wood chips? Um, I kind of yes to both. Um, my compost bin is on the back side of my property behind our shop. It's not actually a bin. Um, I have a family friend who has horses and they actually deliver manure to me. And so that pile of manure just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I, I have kind of two piles. I have one area where it's been composting for about a year and that's what I actually put on my bed. And then I have another pile where they're putting the new manure. And I throw any compost bits into those piles. Um, any food scraps, those all go to the chickens. So I don't really have like a compost bin for food scraps or anything like that because my chickens turn my food scraps into eggs, but I do have a big manure pile. And then the wood chips, yes. I have three big piles here of wood chips. These were all 100% free wood chips from the website chipdrop.com. I will leave a link for that website down below. That is a website that local arborists in your area partner with and it is a way for them to dispose of wood chips and for you to get wood chips. It's 100% free for you. There are a couple stipulations. One, if you're signed up, um, you can tell them to stop whenever you want. But when you're signed up, they will deliver it wherever you specify in the website. They will drop it off where you want it dropped off. But you might not know they're gonna come. Like I've come home from work two times and there's big piles here. Right now I don't need any more wood chips, so I don't have a subscription for it right now. Sometimes they try to contact you, sometimes they don't. And you have to take the entire load. You don't get to decide what type of wood chips are in it. You can decide whether you want sticks and logs or if you just want wood chips. So I specify that I just want chips and they drop it off. I have used these free wood chips to um, line all my paths and I'm using it for my Back to Eden style gardens. What did I learn last year that I'm working on doing better this year? And I think the number one thing is documenting what I'm doing. Last year I documented very little and I really regret that because it's easy to focus on the failures, which I had so many last year. And so I think my brain tends to, you know, I think as humans we tend to focus on the negative more than the positive. And I wish I had documented everything that I harvested and preserved because I could look back on those numbers and be like, wow, that is a lot that I accomplished because I had a ton of success. I grew so many green beans and so many tomatoes and blueberries and there was just a ton of stuff that did really, really, really well. So I need to learn to document better and that's part of why I'm bringing you guys along because it's holding me accountable to document what I'm doing and I definitely wanna show you guys all my failures and be completely transparent with you on that. But I also wanna show my successes so that I can be better at focusing on those as opposed to just getting caught up in the failures. And plus it's kinda of cool to look back and say I grew X many pounds of tomatoes or canned X many amount of jars. So it's gonna be fun. I'm gonna be definitely working on that is journaling and documenting what I'm doing so that I have got a great record to look back on. 
Amber asks if I use the square foot gardening method and I do in my raised beds. Robin asks what I recommend to can slash preserve. And I would say just start with whatever you eat a lot of. Do you eat a lot of jams and jellies? Maybe start with that. Do you like tomato sauce? That was one of the first things that I started canning was tomato sauce because it's a pretty easy thing to can. It's a water bath canning. And I really wanted to get away from using tin cans with tomato products because they're very acidic. And so that's really was the very thing that jump started me into um, wanting to start canning and preserving was getting rid of the tin cans. So I really don't have any recommendations because what I can and what I like to preserve might not be something you even want to eat. So just start looking in your pantry and looking at your diet and thinking, what do I already like to eat? What do I already have in my pantry? And, and what would I like to preserve myself to put in my pantry? Because I've definitely made things that I did because I see everyone else doing it and I don't even like that thing. So I wasted my time, effort, and money canning and preserving something that I don't even like. And I knew I wouldn't like it, but it just seemed like the right thing to do. So can and preserve whatever you like to eat. Michelle asks, what convenience canned foods are you most excited about? And I would say I am most excited about my pressure canning items. Last year I bought my pressure canner and I pressure canned chicken broth and beans and I'm loving having that in the pantry. Um, I've wanted to do that for years and I don't know why I put it off for so long. I've always made my own beans and chicken stock, but I've always frozen them. I would always make big batches and freeze them, but that's such a pain when you wanna use it right away. I have to defrost it um, before I can use it. So I've been really enjoying having my pressure can items on the shelf. Another thing I've been really enjoying having on my pantry shelf is pizza sauce. My husband and I eat homemade pizza quite a bit. Last year was the first year I canned pizza sauce. I don't know why, because I've been canning tomatoes for over six years now, but I would always make my pizza sauce the night I made pizza. And that's so silly because that takes an extra 10 minutes. That's 10 minutes that I could save if I just have it canned on the pantry shelf. I will always have canned pizza sauce on the pantry shelf from now on. We're actually having pizza for dinner tonight. <laughs> um, great question. Ann Haas asked, how many chickens do we have and how many chickens do we have room for? So we currently have 11 chickens. When I bought our chickens back in March of 2020, chicks were like toilet paper. You could not find chicks anywhere in my area. When I would call the different farm stores, they said they would, they would get the chicks in at 9 a.m. on Fridays and you had to be there either an hour or two before they opened because it was first come, first serve and you had to wait in a long line. And back then, I didn't want to wait in a long line with a bunch of people. So I looked online and McMurray Hatchery, uh, I couldn't get chickens until July. They were sold out all the way until July and I wanted chickens now. So my husband wasn't super on board with getting chickens, but he knew that I wanted them. We were planning to get them this year, not last year, but I was off work for 10 weeks because I am a dental hygienist and when the pandemic hit, I was off work for 10 weeks. So I figured it was a good time to get chickens because I had the time to invest in them when they were little chicks. And so I found an online seller that is actually a local one to me in Oregon, and I was able to get them within a week and a half. And I had to order at least 10, and they had to be five of each breed, and I wanted to have multiple colored eggs. So I got 10 chickens, um, because I figured I didn't eat 15. It's just my husband and I. So I ordered those 10 chickens, and then on the first night, one of them did pass away. I ordered two different breeds, one that laid a light brown egg and one that laid, it was called Color Pack, and I think it's a hybrid chicken. They lay from green to blue eggs. And then when I went to Wilco, my local farm store, a few weeks later, after I had them, they did have a breed, I don't remember the name of it, but they lay a really dark brown egg. So I wanted, so I went ahead and I couldn't help myself. I picked up two more. So that's how we ended up with 11 chickens, which is way more chickens than two people need. Another question was, um, how many chickens do we have room for? In our current setup, we, ha we only have room for 11 chickens because my husband built their coop and he built it for 11 chickens but it's not functioning very well for us because our plan was to move it around and the design is a little too heavy and with my husband and I's work schedule, we just don't have time to do that. So on the back half of my property where I can't grow anything because there's way too much shade, I plan to build a pretty big chicken run back there and we will eventually probably end up with more than 11 chickens. We just don't need any more laying chickens. But I know that they're eventually gonna not lay as much, and so I will be getting more chickens um, to kind of replace them. Um, our chickens will never be chicken soup. They are pets to us at this point. You know, they are feeding us by giving us eggs, so I have no problem taking care of them into old age. And so I do need to build a bigger run for them, knowing that in the future, we are probably gonna end up with more than just 11 birds. 
Jamie Fisher asks, do we plan to get goats, other livestock? Right now, we do not plan to get any goats. I see on a lot of other people's YouTube channel that have less than an acre and they have goats. But the way our property is set up, I just don't think I have the space for goats. Um, my husband's shop takes up one eighth of the property. I've got my huge garden here. And the front half of my property is all beautifully landscaped. And I don't plan to change that at all. Um, I need that to keep the value of my home what it is. I think that one acre in a rural setting, probably you could have goats, no problem. I am in the city. I am on one acre, but I am in the city. I'm five minutes from Costco, if that. I'm three minutes from Walmart and Lowe's. I'm 10 minutes from downtown Portland, Oregon. So I need to keep the landscaping in the front of the property the way it is so that it can hold the value of my home. I'm, I don't plan to like rip up landscaping to ha just to have goats. But I have thought about getting meat birds because I know that if I had the time to move them every single day, if I had them in a chicken tractor, I could still keep my beautiful grass beautiful. It would fertilize it and I could move them every day. It wouldn't damage the grass. But I just don't know if my husband and I are at a place where we're ready to butcher our own meat. We actually had a pretty tragic accident with one of our chickens. She, we don't know what happened, but we don't know if she got into my neighbor's property or if my neighbor's dog got into our property, but she was attacked by our neighbor's dog. The dog punctured one of her lungs, um, put a pretty big hole in her back, and ripped off all her tail feathers and bit a big chunk out of her bum. And um, that was pretty traumatic for us. We weren't sure if we should put her down or if my husband should try to do chicken surgery, which he ended up doing. He, he super glued her lung tissue together. I wasn't home, I was at work. And then he super glued her skin together and we kept her really clean and we did give her some antibiotics so that she didn't get any internal um, infection because that's what I was worried about. And she's done really well. She's, she's actually out here. She lived in our house for about a month and a half, but she's back out here with the chickens. And that was pretty traumatic. We raised those birds from little chicks and that's what we would do if we raised meat birds. And so we're just not quite ready um, at a place where we're ready to butcher our own meat. So in the future, it might be. Um, it's something that I, I want to do, but I don't know if we're at a place where we're ready to do it. So I don't plan to get any more livestock per se on this property, but the next thing that I wanna get is uh, honeybees. Next summer, that is my goal, is to get honeybees on this property. That kind of brings us to the next question by Lisa Sardo. She asks, where do I buy my meat? I try to buy my meat from local farmers as much as possible. A great resource if you want to find local farmers in your area is localharvest.org. I'll leave that below. That's where I found the majority of the farmers that produce the meat that I buy from. I do buy all my beef from a farm called Basket Flat Ranch. It's just about 20 minutes north of me. Um, I do like to buy poultry whenever possible from a local farm that's close to me too. He does 100% pasture raised. It's not completely affordable for me to buy all my poultry from him. When I buy whole chickens, I'll buy whole chickens from him because that is a more affordable option. Um, but I can't afford to buy like just chicken breast or things like that from the local farmer in my area. Um, so I do try to buy organic whenever possible. And then pork, I like to buy pork from local farmers as well. Um, I've done that a few times and currently I have just a little bit left in my freezer. So that's something that we need to be putting on our list of things to be purchasing is to buy another whole hog. So Jamie asks, do we plan to move or is this our forever home? Currently we have no plans to move. We just bought this house a little over a year ago and we have a lot of plans that we wanna do with this house. But there are things that we want to do that we can't do with this house. One thing is my husband, his dream is to build a home one day. And so obviously we can't do that here because we already have a home. And I would love the idea of having a milk cow and being able to garden on an even bigger scale than this. So it's definitely an option of us moving. But currently we like the location we're in. We're so close to everything. I think we're close to my side of the family. We're close to my husband's side of the family. And for us to move and get land, we would have to move pretty far out. And neither one of us are willing to do that at this point. So it's definitely not off the table, but you never know what's gonna happen. That's one reason why I'm not gonna just tear up the front yard and put goats in there is because I wanna keep the value of my home. Um, we do plan to do a bunch of remodel projects inside um, to increase the value of our home. So that if we ever needed to move, we would be able to do that. 
Frankie asked, what is our water setup? And we have a well, and I'm super happy about that. So there's no chlorine or anything in our water. Our water is fantastic. The neighborhood was built in the 80s, so it was built before there was any water in this area. And so that's why we are in a well. And we actually are on a septic system too, and I like that. And he also asked, what is my irrigation system set up? So in the landscaping and the grass, um, that was all put in by the previous owner, and my husband's been kind of tweaking it. But my husband built me a beautiful irrigation system in my garden last year, so let me show you what that is. So he trenched from over here where the main water line is, there's the lid. We trenched a huge trench right along here. We came all the way back and we went into the back of the property. In that trench right here, we put internet and more power to the shop. And then we brought the water line out here into the garden. The main line goes between those beds there. It comes through here. and then it splits and there's a main line that goes down the center of the beds. There's a trend comes up underneath the raised bed and then we have two tubes that run along the length of each bed. Each area where you see the little red knob, there is a mister there. Mary Martin asks, what does my family think of my homesteading and have I inspired them to homestead? So I have never asked them this question. I think it's a great question. I know that they're very supportive of my desire to homestead. They're very encouraging and they do benefit from my homestead because I do like to share whenever possible. But I don't know if I've inspired them necessarily to homestead. Thank you guys for hanging out in my garden with me today. I had a fun time answering your questions. If you want to see what this is going to be looking like in a few months, it's going to be super abundant and lush coming pretty soon hopefully. Um, go ahead and subscribe. If you enjoyed this, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to ask me more questions or if you have, have any tips or tricks for me, leave them down in the comments below. I hope you guys have a great night and I will see you guys next time. Bye guys.